Welcome to another psychiatry lecture. I'm Sam Asgarian, and we'll be going over somatoform, fictitious, personality disorders, and malingering. It'll be a lot of fun because we'll describe the different personality types and the characteristics of these patient populations in order to differentiate them from each other and also to remember them better on exam day. So for the somatoform disorders, we need to note the physical symptoms will occur with no medical explanation. The symptoms are severe enough to adversely affect the level of functioning. The patient keeps coming back to the physicians, requiring help because the symptoms are that bad. It's frequent in young women, so look for that in the clinical vignette. And it usually has a psychological component. What the patient is unaware of is that psychological component. So you treat this with psychotherapy. The source of symptoms is psychological. Once you address the psychological component, the symptoms tend to completely resolve. So for somatization, here's another one where you want to count the number of symptoms. There's going to be four pain symptoms, two GI symptoms, one sexual issue, and one pseudoneurological symptom. Hypochondriasis, these patients tend to believe that they have some specific disease despite constant reassurance. If you've been in the hospital wards, you know these are the patients who come in and swear to you that they either have an infection or some type of neoplasm. They don't say, this is all the stuff that's wrong with me. They say, doctor, I think I have an infection. I swear I have some kind of cancer. For somatization, they don't know what's wrong with them. They just know that a lot of things are wrong with them and you have to count and decide whether it's somatization or hypochondriasis. Conversion disorder is a fun one because of how unique it is. It affects voluntary motor or sensory functions indicative of a medical condition. It's usually caused by psychological factors and it's associated with la belle indifference. What that means is the person actually isn't concerned about something, like their leg will stop moving and it doesn't bother them that much. They're indifferent to it. And that's a, a sign of conversion disorder. They're unconcerned about their impairment. And that usually leads you to believe that there's a psychological issue that needs treatment more so than the actual motor or sensory issue. For body dysmorphic disorder, what you want to note is the patient believing that some part of his or her body is abnormal, defective, or misshapen. The picture is what they think they look like. But friends and family and you yourself will note that they don't even remotely look like they have an issue. It's a body image disorder. And these people will seem like surgery addicts because no matter what, they still believe that they have a defect. So they'll go and get more and more cosmetic operations and still be unconvinced that they look normal or that they look good. Pain disorder, the main complaint, obviously, is going to be the presence of pain. And it must have psychological factors associated with pain. These people will say that no matter what you give them, they still hurt. They still feel aches and pains. That's the difference between body dysmorphic disorder and pain disorder. Pain, that's their main issue, whereas the body part or body image is the main issue for BDD. Let's do a case. We've got a 35-year-old married mother of three who has frequent complaints of dizziness, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, pain during intercourse, paresthesias, leg pain, stomach pain, food intolerance, and headaches. She has tried numerous medications, but none have been beneficial. Her neurological examination, normal. So what's our ask? What's the next step in the management of this patient? Hopefully you've already diagnosed somatization disorder. She has all of these issues and with the neuro exam being normal there's really not a root medical cause so what are you going to do to treat you've got a bunch of options here take a look you've got your benzo the ssri you've got something used for bipolar and antipsychotic psychotherapy and the correct one as usual is going to be individual psychotherapy you don't want to medicate them here remember it's a psychological issue if you treat that issue then these symptoms will resolve. So individual psychotherapy is correct. Benzos for anxiety, uh, the SSRI for fibromyalgia and depression, lithium for bipolar, and the antipsychotic for psychosis. C is the correct answer. Factitious disorder. This might have already appeared on step one, and it does appear on step two. It's when an individual fakes an illness to get attention and emotional support in the patient role. 
it's psychological or physical illness. So they'll tell you that mentally they're not doing well or physically they're not doing well. The psychological symptoms can be hallucinations, delusions, depression, and or bizarre behavior. The physical symptoms are general. They're abdominal pain, my stomach hurts, fever, oh, nausea, vomiting, or hematomas. Basically, you need a lab test to help you out here. Look for someone who's taking insulin or thyroid hormone, something to do to make themselves feel sick to take on that patient role. As I told you, they could take insulin, they could take thyroid hormone, they might actually be self-inflicting life-threatening injuries on themselves. And the behavior may be compulsive at times, they just want to go to the hospital and be treated like a patient. It formerly was known as Munchausen syndrome. And factitious disorder by proxy is when a parent or caretaker fakes the signs and symptoms in a child or someone that they're taking care of. Usually it's a child in order to assume the sick role by proxy as the caregiver. The parent just wants to be in the hospital and their child could be sick, so they could be poisoning or inflicting injuries on their child. That's usually a clear-cut sign of informing Child Protective Services. So what type of patients do we see with factitious disorder? Typically, it's women with a history of being employed in healthcare. Those are the pharmacists and nurses. They know the system really well and know how to play the system to get what they want. The men more often have physical symptoms than the women do. But ultimately, the patient's goal is admission to the hospital. They want a bed. They want an inpatient admission. You always, you know this as a physician, have to exclude any medical disorder with similar symptoms. So you can get a peptide C level, you can get blood tests, you can get imaging, whatever it needs to teach you that you're right. You know that they have factitious disorder based on the vignette and the test, the initial test that you've run, pointing to the fact that there's no medical illness involved. So treatment, it's really tough. There's no specific therapy that's been proven to be effective once you've diagnosed factitious disorder. When a child is involved, we've said this already, if it's factitious disorder by proxy, always involve child protective services. You want to make sure these children are safe and they're not in that particular environment, so you might need to take them away from their home. So make sure if that's an answer choice option, you choose contact child protective services. Factitious disorder is different from malingering, and this might be an answer choice that you need to either eliminate or focus on depending on the information in the vignette. Malingering, it's characterized by conscious production of signs and symptoms for an obvious gain. You don't want to take on the, the role of an inpatient. You want to avoid work. You want to evade criminal prosecution. Anyone who's worked in a jail environment knows that malingering is very common. Or you want to achieve financial gain. A lot of times people will go on disability. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're getting a monthly payment for being disabled secondary to an injury on the job. It's not a mental illness. This is conscious. It's active. These people know what they're doing. They're trying to gain something. And that's the difference between malingering and factitious disorder is that there's an actual gain. You can physically or tangibly say this is what they're getting by acting sick. So how are you going to diagnose this very difficult to diagnose disorder? Well, what you want to note is in the vignette, it'll be common more frequently in prisoners and military personnel. Prisoners want to be in the sick bed. They get better food. They're away from the general population. Military personnel, they don't have to go out. They don't have to fight. They don't have to do all of the training involved if they tell you they're sick. It's typically diagnosed when there's a discrepancy between the patient's complaints and actual physical or laboratory findings. For factitious disorder and malingering, your exams, whether it's your physical exam, blood work, imaging, anything else is going to lead you to that diagnosis. There's not going to be any medical issue wrong with them, but they are going to complain about something and the clues in the vignette lead you to either factitious disorder or malingering. So what happens once you say, okay, I think it's malingering? If that's your diagnosis, you have to confront the patient with the outcome. After all of the exams, what we've concluded is that you're faking. That's so difficult, but it has to be done. And a lack of cooperation from patients is characteristic of malingering. Note that because of the healthcare system, all they have to do is leave you and go somewhere else. So a ton of times what you'll see in the vignette is after being seen at multiple hospitals, a patient comes to you. 
or after confronting them, the patient leaves. That's mostly indicative of, and the answer choice that you would choose there is malingering. Moving on now, we'll discuss a little bit more about adjustment disorder. So we discussed acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. Adjustment disorder is similar, but it's subtly different, a theme that keeps repeating itself in psychiatry. Here, it's a maladaptive reaction to an identifiable stressor. It's the loss of a job, a divorce, or failure in school. It usually occurs within three months of the stressor and has to remit within six months of removing that stressor. The symptoms here are going to be anxiety, depression, disturbances of conduct, and it can be severe enough to cause impairment in function. A big differentiator between this and something like post-traumatic stress disorder is the severity of the stressor. A loss of job, a divorce, or a failure in school leads to adjustment disorder. Being a prisoner of war, being sexually assaulted, witnessing a murder of a close one in front of you is going to lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. So note that severity and also note the symptoms to help you decide between adjustment disorder, acute stress disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. How are you going to treat adjustment disorder? You're going to use psychotherapy. Both individual and group therapy have been used effectively. You're not going to medicate these patients. You want them to talk about what happened. You don't want to bottle it up, so they'll discuss their details of their divorce, the failure in school, or the loss of the job, and eventually they'll overcome those feelings and those symptoms that they have. All right, now the fun begins, the personality disorders. These can be fun. I'll try to make them as entertaining as possible, and we'll get through them and note the differences between them and how to choose the correct answer when you're faced with a vignette that leads you to think that there's a definite personality disorder going on. So let's discuss the personality disorders. There's three types, but they're patterns in behavior that are pervasive, inflexible, and maladaptive. The cluster A, these are the weirdos in society. It's the paranoid schizoid and or schizotypal personality disorders. For cluster B, these are the bad ones in society. You'd see histrionic, antisocial, borderline, and the narcissistic personality disorders. For cluster C, these are the wimps. These are definitely the weaklings in society. Avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. We'll go through each cluster and I'll tell you about specific things to look for in the vignette to help you choose the correct answer choice. So for paranoid personality disorder, you really want to look at this closely and see how it's different from the schizophrenic psychotic disorder. For paranoid, these people are suspicious, mistrustful, secretive, isolated, and you'd also see them questioning the loyalty of family and friends. They think that everyone is out to get them and that people are trying to steal from them. So note too, when we move on to schizoid, these are the loners. They have a choice of solitary activities. They lack close friends. They show emotional coldness and they have no desire or enjoyment of close relationships. And what's noted is they actually choose lifestyles that enable their personality disorder. What I mean by that is they choose actual careers that give them solitary activities. These are people who are the ones in charge of movie theater projections. They sit up in the booth in the dark all day long and play movies. Or they're night watchmen. They have the graveyard shift all by themselves all the time. They don't want to have friends. They're happy being loners. In addition, you'd see schizotypal, and this one's fun. They have ideas of reference, magical thinking is a really big one, odd thinking, eccentric behavior, and increased social anxiety. Brief psychotic episodes are possible. For schizotypal, these are people who have those rooms full of uh, black light posters, they've got dragon statues, they love the magic eight ball. That's that toy that you shake and it tells you an answer to a question you ask it. It says it might be so or it could be so. They play Ouija boards. They believe that dolls are magical and that the dolls can talk or come alive. They're very strange and that's what gives you schizotypal. Schizoid are the loners and paranoid, which you know it's not one particular thing that they have. That's delusional disorder. It's one thing for delusional disorder that they're constantly suspicious of. Paranoid personality disorder, they're 
suspicious of many things, lots of things. And that helps you differentiate these personality disorders from mood disorders and possibly psychotic disorders as well. So hopefully after this slide, you pretty much have a strong grasp of histrionic personality disorder. These are people who must be the center of attention. They display inappropriate sexual behavior. They're very dramatic and they use their physical appearance to draw attention to themselves. So here's a good image. Here, look at the facial hair, the earring, the black leather jacket, the collar has to be propped up. So for disorganized schizophrenia in the earlier lecture, I said that you know most of the times we remember there's a positive headgear sign. Disorganized schizophrenics wear something very strange on their heads, aluminum foil hats or something with bunny ears. The mustache sign is important for histrionic. They'll have very, very dramatic facial hair for the men. They dress over the top. They're overtly sexual, and that gives them more attention. That, that attention-seeking behavior is a hallmark of histrionic personality disorder. So in the very beginning of the psychiatry lectures, when we did childhood disorders, we talked about conduct disorder. And conduct disorder, once you get to adulthood, usually leads to antisocial personality disorder. Here, it's a failure to conform to social rules. These people are deceitful. There's a lack of remorse. They're impulsive. They're aggressive toward others. They're irresponsible, and they must be an adult. If they're less than 18, it's conduct disorder. The borderline personality disorder, it's a little less severe than antisocial, just like oppositional defiant disorder was compared to conduct disorder. For borderline, you, these are people, men and women, in unstable relationships. They're also impulsive. They have recurrent suicidal behaviors. Drug use and drug abuse is very common in borderline personality disorder. They'll tell you that they have chronic feelings of emptiness and inappropriate anger. They'll throw temper tantrums quite easily, and they're dissociative when they're severely stressed. They'll do things and tell you it wasn't them. It's not normal for them and brief psychotic episodes. And what I mean, unstable relationships combined with brief psychotic episodes is very dangerous. These are people who, if they feel betrayed by their lover, they'll seek revenge. They'll go and they'll boil their pets or do something extremely impulsive that's also borderline psychotic. And that's where that personality disorder comes into play. Narcissistic is pretty easy to diagnose. Actually, of all of these, especially in cluster B, it's the easiest. It's that grandiose sense of self, belief that they're super special. They lack empathy for others. These people believe that the world, the sun, everything revolves around them. And that's where that sense of entitlement comes in. And that excessive admiration is extremely important to them. Therefore, narcissistic is least likely to appear on the test because it's quite simple, especially when you compare it to antisocial and borderline personality disorders. Moving on to cluster C, we'll start off with avoidant personality disorder. These are people who are unwilling to get involved with other people in social situations. They view themselves as socially inept. They're reluctant to take risks and they have feelings of inadequacy. So this is important. These people don't have many friends. Especially compared to schizoid, both of them are loners. The biggest difference between avoidant and schizoid, remember we said that cluster A, those are the weirdos in society. Cluster C, these are the weaklings in society. Because avoidant personality disorder, these people actually want to have friends. They want to be in social situations, but they can't because they're unwilling to. They don't want to take risks and they don't feel like they're worthy. That's the difference. Schizoid, they're content. They don't want friends, and therefore their lives can revolve around solitary activities. Dependent personality disorders, these people have difficulty making day-to-day -day decisions. They're unable to assume responsibility, and they're unable to express disagreement. They'll agree with whatever you say. They have a fear of being alone, and as a result, they seek relationships as a source of care. They're dependent on someone else. And early on dependent on their parents or siblings and later on dependent on their spouses or significant others to do everything for them. Lastly, the obsessive compulsive. This is different than the obsessive compulsive disorder. This is the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. These are people preoccupied with details. They're rigid, they're orderly, they're perfectionists, they're excessively devoted to work, and they're inflexible. 
This might seem like an insult, but I swear it's easy to look at this and say these are medical students or people in the medical profession. A lot of people in healthcare have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. You kind of actually have to to do well in that situation. And that might help you differentiate it from obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder where you have obsessions and compulsions, you can't be a physician to someone with that type of issue because you're going to constantly have to go back and lock the door to the exam room and unlock it. Whereas here, you're just rigid. You're too much of a perfectionist. You have to make sure that everything is perfect before you move on. So what's important to note is these are personality disorders. These people can still function. They have jobs. They graduate from school. They have families. It's just that there's this personality issue that prevents them from leading fulfilling lives. So you do want to treat this and you don't want to medicate them. You want to prescribe individual psychotherapy so that they confront what's going on. You only medicate them if there's an actual mood or anxiety symptom present and the medication is directed at the mood disorder or the anxiety symptoms, not the personality disorder. The personality disorder can only be overcome with individual psychotherapy. So here's a good one. Which of the following personality disorders has been associated with positive psychotic symptoms? Remember, positive psychotic symptoms, those are like the hallucinations, seeing or hearing things that aren't there. Look through and see which one you see. And we talked about the psychotic issues of A, borderline personality disorder. Schizotypal, if it was there, was another one that you could choose. Remember, borderline, these are people who take revenge on their lovers in very, very severe ways. And schizotypal are the type that have magical thinking. They think that their dolls can come alive and talk to them or that eventually dragons will come and take over the earth and they'll fight these dragons with lightsabers. It's not the other ones. The only ones that are are borderline and schizotypal.